My name is Sho McLaw. I'm the World Bank's global lead for territorial and spatial development. I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes the research we've been doing over the last three years looking at the spatial development of African cities. The title of my presentation is Africa Cities Opening Doors to the World. So the main issues in this presentation is that Africa cities are growing fast in terms of people. Yet, the growth in terms of its economy has not kept pace. So at the World Bank, we have been doing research on African cities for the past two years with the London School of Economics and researchers at Oxford. And we try to untangle the reasons behind it. One of the common factors everybody thinks about is low capital investment. Part of the reason is that Africa's urbanizing while it's relatively poor. In fact, Africa is about 40% urban when incomes are $1,100 per capita. If you think about East Asia, when it was 40% urban, had incomes $3,500 per capita. So clearly one can make that argument that African cities are not developing in terms of economic gains because of low capital investment. But I want to tell you that there's a deeper reason. And the deeper reason is that African cities are close to the world. Compared with cities in other developing countries, cities in Africa produce very few goods and services that are traded internationally, traded outside the country within the continent itself. And then the question is, how can you as researchers and you as policymakers get African cities on a path that would open their doors to the world? And the main issues here I want to tell you about is by doing two things. And those two things are about path dependence and policy interdependence. And this includes formalizing land markets, clarifying property rights, and getting in place really effective urban planning. The second priority is to have early and coordinated infrastructure investments. So let me start off by giving you this picture. This picture in front of you is drawn from the World Bank's enterprise surveys and it looks at firms in Africa and in other developing countries. And there's one thing that's striking. The majority of what you see in this data are that African firms or firms in African cities are trading internally and they're doing non-tradable goods and services. In fact, when we looked at the statistics, if you looked at firms in Asian cities, about 70% of firms were doing activities in the tradable sector. What it means that the demand for their activities is not linked or not limited by the local city. The world is the oyster. On the other hand, when you look at African cities, the number is much lower. It's 50%. That means a large share of what African cities produce in terms of manufacturing, industry, goods and services is consumed locally. So the market size is effectively limited to the city's own, own economy. So in essence, the argument we want to put with this really interesting graphic is that Africa cities are close to the world. And in order for them to grow economically, as they're growing in people, Africa cities must open their doors to the rest of the world. So the question I want to think about today, along with you, is why have African cities remained local? When you think about the research literature on this, a common idea is natural resource development. And it's a paradoxical idea, because why would something that's growing your economy be limiting your cities to trading locally? The second issue that researchers at Oxford and LSE, along with colleagues at the bank, as part of this research project have been looking at, is urban form. How is it that cities are built and how they are spatially organized? So in much of the economics literature for the past 10 years, there has been this big idea that natural resource development creates a high demand for non-tradable goods and services. What you see on these graphs in front of you is that for non-resource exporters, the trajectory of urbanization and incomes is pretty much going hand in hand. And Africa's no really different. It may be a little slower, but that pattern goes on. But you look at resource exporters on the right. The lines completely scatter out. There is absolutely very little link between urbanization and incomes for resource exporters. The reason for this is that as natural resources are exported, the prices in the local economy increase. 
So you, what you see is an urban Dutch disease in addition to the national Dutch disease. This makes it very difficult for local producers to actually compete in markets globally. The second thing is that once you have a lot of natural resource rents, there's a demand for non-tradable goods produced in cities. You want better homes, you want better quality of food, construction goes up, it creates a boom in non-tradable economies. So Africa's at this opportunity. Today, commodity prices are falling and there's an, a window to get things right. So what's the other big idea? Is the form of African cities. And the research we do show that African cities, instead of being livable and being productive, they're crowded, they're disconnected, and as a result, they're very costly. In fact, Africa cities are limited to being local by the urban form. And our research looked very carefully at 64 cities across Africa, covering the entire continent, and bringing to light information from very high satellite high-resolution satellite data, along with economic census data and demographic census data from the country level. So the first point is, from all this research, we find that African cities are crowded with people, but not dense with capital. And there's a big difference between the two. So if you were to think about the organization of people, the density of people, Africa is not really an outlier. It's somewhere between the Middle East and North Africa, and East Asia and the Pacific. But where things get really different is the urbanization of capital. And what we find is that the urbanization of capital far lags the urbanization of people. We took pictures or used pictures taken from satellites at two in the morning, which were a good reflection of infrastructure density. And what we see, no matter for cities of different sizes in Africa, the infrastructure to people ratio is far lower than in cities like Durban or Barcelona or for Lagos, it's cities like Paris or Rio. And the reason I use these examples, and you may think, why is he using an example from a developed country, is that cities, once they reach a certain size, they need amounts of capital investments in transit, in homes, in basic public goods to make these cities functional. Otherwise, the cost of congestion will override any productivity benefit the cities can deliver. The second thing, we also looked at macro data. And in the macro data, we find that Africa has capital investment in terms of GDP far lower than in times when China was rapidly urbanizing, during a period where East Asia was rapidly urbanizing. So Sub-Saharan Africa spends about 20% of GDP on capital investment compared to China uh, in its peak, which is spending 50% of GDP in capital investment. As a result, what we see is that people in African cities are really trading off livability so that they can live closer to opportunity. The packed and crowded living quarters in Dar es Salaam, we did a very good household survey where we find on average the three people share a room. But it's not only sharing a room. The whole idea is that African cities are undercapitalized. We did a very large-scale research program looking at risk insurance data, asking what it would take to rebuild a city if it was faced with a disaster. And the values of replacement in terms of square kilometers of land area, in terms of dollars per floor area, were much lower than even the most lowest of Central American cities. So what we see places like Kigali, Dar es Salaam, the replacement values are actually a fraction of what you see in other parts of the world. So we did a whole range of research looking at amenities, looking at physical and human capital, but the big point that comes out of all this research is that African cities are urbanizing in terms of people, but not dense in terms of capital. But if you were to wonder if this was the biggest problem, let me assure you it's not, because some of these capital investment problems can be fixed later on. But what's really at the heart of the problem is that African cities are disconnected. Disconnected in terms of land, people, jobs, and firms. And we looked at a lot of uh, evidence from satellite data, and we found that compared to cities in Latin America, African cities and the residents of African cities had far fewer people to interact with. In fact, what this means, that if you were having an idea and you were in a city and you wanted to explore that idea with other like-minded people,
you just wouldn't have them right beside you. In addition, what we see is that African cities are much more fragmented in the center compared to cities in other parts of the world. And this is just one part of the picture. The other part that is really worrying is the spatial nature in which African cities are growing. And if you think about expansion of cities in terms of infill, in terms of extension, in terms of leapfrog, the majority of what you see in African cities comes from leapfrog patches where cities are growing as isolated little islands not connected to each other. I tell you this is a major problem because think about a mayor of a city who wants to expand public goods and services. It is impossible to provide services at scale and at low cost when you don't have economies of density. This is a major problem. This is a lock-in that if we don't think about right now, we're going to lock African cities into a pattern that we're going to regret for generations to come. So between this, that the African cities are crowded and they're disconnected, what we found that African cities are in a low development trap. What it means that African cities are incredibly costly for firms and for businesses. And we did econometric work looking at the shape of a city, the form of a city, and the cost of a city. And we find that lower the fragmentation, lower the cost. So higher fragmented cities have high cost. In fact, in the research literature, this is one of the first pieces of evidence that links urban form with urban costs. And we did a very large sample survey looking at household cost of living across Africa using CPI deflated indicators. And we find that African cities face incredibly high prices for their current income levels. In fact, cities in Africa are about 29% more expensive than cities in other developing countries. And even things like food. Basic food items are 33% higher in Africa cities versus elsewhere. And housing prices are about 57% higher than cities in other parts of the world. You must be thinking, OK, so what's he getting at? Cities are disconnected, cities are crowded, and yet cities are costly. What it means is that you're locking your city into the trap of non-tradables. I won't go into detail in explaining this set of charts, but it's based on a paper that Tony Venables at Oxford has done for us. And in this paper, the point he makes is that if you're a firm in the tradable sector, you have to pay wages high enough to offset urban cost of living. And if your urban cost of living are so high that firms in the tradable sector won't come in, then you're stuck with firms in the non-tradable sector, local firms. And guess what they do? They pass on all these high costs to local consumers because international consumers will definitely not consume these costs. So you get into this vicious cycle where high cost, dysfunctional urban structure makes cities costly, it locks you into non-tradables, bids up costs further, and that cycle kind of goes on and on. So as we think about springing African cities from this low development trap, I want you to remember two issues. One is about addressing pad dependence. The second is about policy interdependence. What do I mean by this? In terms of pad dependence, think about urban form. When the structure of a city is laid out, it doesn't disappear instantly. It'll live with us for 50 years, for 100 years, for 150 years. So the decisions we make today are going to influence not only what our children do in cities, but their kids and their kids. So it's very important to think about getting things right early on. The second is policy interdependence. So if you think about doing policies in housing, but don't think about doing policies in infrastructure, the returns to your housing policies are muted. So if you build a road, and then you don't think about energy, or you don't think about the urban plan, the returns to a road are limited. So the point I want to make is everything we do in cities requires coordination across sectors in one space. But for that to happen, we need our urban planning to be very credible. So the first point in terms of patent dependence is that one needs to think about clarifying property rights, getting land markets to work, and putting in place effective urban planning regulations. I want to tell you an example of why this matters. I don't know if any of you have heard about this group called the Nubians, but they've been living in Nairobi for many years. They fought for the king's rifles when Kenya was under British rule. And as a reward, they were given pieces of land in today's Kibera but nobody remembered to give them property rights. As a result, what happens is there's a huge misallocation of land 
in some of the most valuable parts of Nairobi. And research by Vernon Henderson has shown that this value is about a $1.86 billion land differential between the potential what could be in development and what the land is used for now. So think about it. The fact that we don't have capital investment is not only about pouring concrete or pouring money in, it's about instituting the right kinds of land policies. The second example I want to tell you comes from Dar es Salaam. In Dar es Salaam, there are lot size regulations that tell you the minimum lot size is about 375 square meters. And what this means is that it kind of condemns most of the city into informality because there aren't too many people, especially poor people in the city, who can put the resources together to assemble a plot of land that's 375 square meters. The reason is we need to be flexible in how we make land use decisions, how we make planning decisions. The picture on the right is something I took when I took my kids out to Philadelphia, a founding city in America, where when the settlers came in, the lot size was 28 square meters. That picture on the bottom right, that's the footprint of a settler's original home. And the point is that one needs to be flexible. As incomes increase, development standards can change, but if the development standards are not compatible with the affordability and preferences of people, they're unlikely to work very well in, in any case. The second point, once we move from land markets, is to get early and coordinated infrastructure investments, allowing for interlinkages between sites, structures, and basic services. And here, the whole idea is that early investments in infrastructure often have a huge return, and these need to be coordinated with land use policies. So in conclusion, I want to tell you, the big challenge for economic development is to ensure that African cities can open the doors to the world. Because that's the only way we can think about jobs and economic growth that will be totally compatible with the growing population of African cities. Thank you.